Welcome to the Expository Songs Podcast. We discuss songs where the main idea of a passage of scripture is the main idea of the song. My name is Daniel Mount, and today we're discussing the Greater Vision song, The Voice I Could Not Resist, written and sung by today's guest, Rodney Griffin. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. I appreciate the opportunity. It's always good to talk with you. Thank you so much. Uh, and to the listener, if you've never heard this song, I'd encourage you to pause this podcast now and listen to the song. It's linked in the show notes. And then uh, come back and listen to the conversation, and you'll appreciate this more that way. Uh, and also to the listeners, some of you know well who Rodney Griffin is, but for those of you who don't, uh, he joined Greater Vision in 1993 and has sung with them for the last 30 years. He's written many hit songs and won plenty of awards, uh, and I could list them, and it would be impressive, but that doesn't seem quite right here, because the quality of the songs he writes speak for themselves. Uh, and so it's just an honor to have you here today. It's my honor, Daniel. I've, Thank you. I appreciate your friendship for many years, and we've always had good, deep discussions. Yes. And uh, I appreciate your uh, <clears throat> expertise in theology and how you... Uh, approach gospel music and you're always looking for the little nugget that most people uh kind of skim over so i appreciate you digging out those gospel music nuggets thank you so much well this <laughs> song is definitely one of those nuggets uh it was definitely I mean, the listeners of the trio appreciated it in its time but i think it's been long enough that newer fans of the group might not know it so well and i think this is definitely a a, a not a forgotten gem, but a gem that definitely deserves a little more attention. Uh, but before we get into talking about the song specifically, especially for the benefit of listeners who might be new to you, new to Greater Vision, I'd like to start by just uh, asking about your background. Uh, both, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit of your testimony of how you came to Saving Faith in Jesus, and then about how your interest in singing and songwriting came about. Yeah, well, my dad was an alcoholic when I was born, and uh, at an early age, uh, my early age, he was uh, led to Christ through a friend that he worked with at Newport News Shipbuilding in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, his name was Bill West, and uh, for many years I've told audiences across the country about this uh, simple non-preacher, non-singer, non-musician who just led a consistent life. And the confidence grew uh, for Bill West, and that's how my dad had confidence to be saved. And when he did, it totally changed the course of our family, which that's what Jesus does, right? So uh, soon after that, my dad surrendered to preach. We moved back to Kentucky uh, where he and mom were from, and uh, he started uh, going to Bible college and uh, started pastoring full-time, and then at the age of 12, I was in a Sunday night service, and I just felt the Lord uh, pulling on my heart that I needed to be saved, so I, I stepped forward and asked the pastor, uh, I said, I need to be saved, and that was my dad. Jeff Griffin. And uh, God. so fast forward then uh, through high school, I started singing uh, with uh, just some local guys in our chorus, our uh, high school chorus. We we said, hey, we all love Southern gospel music, so let's sing some songs. And we created a quartet and sang in local churches. And I had a great time uh, there in Pulaski County, Kentucky, mostly sang locally. And then I uh, went to Berea College uh, pursuing a biology degree. I thought I was going to try to be a doctor. But when I got in those high-level calculus and chemistry classes, which you would probably be great at, Daniel, I, uh, I, wasn't. I, I struck out. <laughs> uh, I passed, but you have to get A's. Uh, to get into med school. So I knew that I needed to make a change in my direction. So I loved landscaping. So I kind of went from the medical side to the horticultural side and studied uh, 
horticultural design and landscape gardening, which I had enjoyed during the summers working in greenhouses in Kentucky. So when I graduated college, I moved back out to Newport News, Virginia, because there was a thriving economy out there, unlike here in Kentucky. It was kind of stagnant. And I rented a trailer from the same man that had led my dad to the Lord all those years before, Bill West. And he's Hmm. still consistent, a wonderful man attending the same church. So uh, I started working at Newport News Shipbuilding soon after I moved out there, even though I went out for landscape design. He kind of pulled me toward the shipyard. And because of my degree, uh, even though it wasn't in shipbuilding, he helped me to uh, get a nice position there in the, believe it or not, nuclear quality department. So I, was I had a... never heard that detail before. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they build the aircraft carriers and submarines for for mm-hmm. the Navy. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. I was in that department first as an inspector and then worked my way up to the office. But all the while, Daniel, I was sitting there at my desk unfulfilled. And uh, I enjoyed... Uh, any opportunity I could find to sing in my church had no outlet. Uh, but during my breaks, I found myself at 23 years of age uh, writing songs. And I don't know why. Uh, I'd only written silly songs, uh, funny things until then. I don't know what it was. There's a just this inside passion to convey the thoughts I was having and to put them in a musical style. So that's when I started writing at age 23. So that was before you were singing full time then. Yeah, I I had no outlet. I just, uh, those first, I don't know, 30 songs that I wrote, maybe 25, they were in a place where I didn't have any singers to sing them. I did begin singing in a part-time group there at the very end before I, uh, it's an interesting story if you haven't heard it. Here's the quick version. Back then, there's no internet. This is 1990, uh, 1991. There's no internet. There are no websites. There are no cell phones. The only contact you had was the singing news magazine. Mm Mm-hmm. And was it valuable? When it came into your mailbox, that was your only news for a whole month. And in the in the back and throughout the magazine, groups would run uh, just ads for their newest release or whatever. So I just grown had grown discouraged in working at the shipyard. I really wanted to sing, and I was willing to give everything up for it. So this is exactly how it happened. I uh, got my singing news, and I looked for any group in southern Ohio. Why is that? Because Hmm. my parents were pastoring at that point in southern Ohio. So I thought, you know what? I'll just move in their basement and sing wherever I can. I'll quit the shipyard, sell my condo, my new truck, just start life over. Hmm. So... I opened the magazine that month and looked for any group in Southern Ohio. And I found this little eighth of a page ad in the bottom corner. And it was a group I never heard of. Higher Dedication. Like, Mm -hmm. who is that? Well, I knew they were in Southern Ohio, so I called them. Of course, it's a landline back then. Rotary phone. And I said, hey, you don't know me. Rodney Griffin here. I'm working at the shipyard in Newport News, Virginia. I'm getting ready to move to Southern Ohio. And do you know of any groups in Southern Ohio that are part-time that are looking for a singer that I might could get connected with? And they said, yes, we are. So the very first call, Hmm. and they said, and we just went full-time, so we're leaving next week for California. And I'm like, are you kidding me? one call. So I knew this was wow. God working in my life. So I bought a quick one-way ticket. I just knew it was God's will. Quick one-way ticket to Cincinnati. 
landed. They picked me up, went and tried it out. They said, you'll do. So I got the job, and believe it or not, it was the tenor position. It was a trio, and they didn't didn't sing real high. So I didn't care, just any position. I... uh, I feel like that's the attitude it takes to to make mm-hmm. the long haul in gospel music is you yes. can't have requirements requirements that say, okay, I'll only do this if, if, if. I was like, hey, I'm going to sell everything and just do whatever to sing. So my dad and I rented a U-Haul. We drove back to Newport News, Virginia. I gave my notice at the shipyard, which they didn't need a notice. Just you could stop working at any time. And I put my condo up for sale, put my new truck up for sale, and back I went with my belongings to Hillsboro, Ohio, moved in their basement, and then got on a bus for California. And my first group was higher dedication, and I was just there about three months, and the group kind of collapsed. They probably weren't ready for full time, uh, but... The opportunity stopped. It was clear I needed to find something else. Got the uh, singing news back out. And I looked in the back, and the Brashears out of Russellville, Arkansas, were looking for a singer. So I got my phone, went to the phone, called, hey, I would love to try out. They said, where do you live? I said, I'm living in southern Ohio. They said, well, we're going to be there this weekend. Like, okay. So I drove up there, met them, tried out, got the job, and next thing I know, I'm moving my belongings to Russellville, Arkansas. So that's how fast wow. God propelled me um, into this music. I was there for six months, and then the Dixie Melody Boys were looking in Nashville for a baritone. Somebody introduced me to them, and before I knew it, I was a Dixie Melody Boy. <clears throat> and that's when my first song was recorded when I joined the Dixie Melody Boys in 1992. I recall hearing a live album they did in 92 or so where they mentioned it was a song you did. Was that that the first one or was that a different one? Okay. First recorded song on the live in Marion, Illinois recording, Dixie Melody Boys. I couldn't remember the town it was recorded and I didn't brush up on that before this. I'm just, you know, going off memory here. Cool. Uh, and then you were with them about two years two or so years. Then went with Greater Vision? And went with Greater Vision. And this December will be 30 years for me here. So it's just crazy how fast it happened. And then once I got with Greater Vision, uh, it's just where I was supposed to be. So yeah, I've been very blessed. Thank you. That's... Th- I knew the general outline of the story, but there were definitely a few details in there I hadn't heard before, and it's really cool. Uh, So moving on to talk about the song itself, uh, The Voice I Could Not Resist. When Southern Gospel fans hear that I'm talking to Rodney Griffin about a Lazarus song, they'll assume, of course, that we're talking about My Name is Lazarus. Um, And I love that song. It's, you know, it's it's a classic for a reason, and I, I, I love that song. But... Uh, there's another song you wrote about Lazarus that I like even more because it speaks to me at a very deep level, and that's the voice I could not resist. Uh, but just as a as an opening question on the song, when a songwriter has written one of their biggest songs on a particular person or story from the Bible, because this is like five, six, seven years after My Name is Lazarus, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes a songwriter might be hesitant to write another song about that same person. Um, do you, do you recall if you had any hesitation to revisit Lazarus or was this idea just so different that you were comfortable? It was different enough. No, I have no problem at all writing. I've written other songs about Lazarus since then. So, uh, the woman at the well, I've written many songs about yes. that story. So I don't think because the, depths of the miracles in the Bible and the depths of the power of God, they're supernatural, supernatural. So just one song is just one angle at it. You can step over a few inches and you've got another Mm -hmm. angle. Step over a few inches, you have another angle. So you can just keep on writing uh, 
I, Phil Cross told me once uh, that his mentor told him, his songwriting mentor, uh, Calvary never runs out of a song. And that is so true. And all these Bible stories, because it's the power of the gospel and the power of God through Jesus, there'll always be something to write about. That's a good way of putting it. I, I like how you talk about taking a few steps over and looking at it from a, from a different angle, which this song uh, definitely does. So we were talking about this a little bit before we hit record, uh, but what do you remember, if anything, about how the song came together? What parts, got first verse come first, chorus come next, that sort of thing, and whether it came together quickly or, or took a while? I think it was one that, uh, in my original notes, I went back and looked at those, and I sent you a copy of those. <clears throat> that all was so notes, cool to see. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All, all the notes say is that we were singing at... Uh, a church in Georgia, uh, something tabernacle, Baptist tabernacle in Georgia. And I must have gotten the idea. Sometimes I get the idea in the middle of our set. And I have no idea why, but something pops in my head. Uh, or it may have been right after sound check. Hmm. Uh, maybe I was walking through the church and saw something on the bulletin board that made me think about Lazarus or voices uh, or what it would, must have been like for Lazarus to hear that voice and know he had no choice but to obey and come forth. So I can't remember exactly the details of writing it because it's been almost 20 sure. years ago, and uh, I had a little hair back then. But as I look back on my notes, I see where... Maybe I got the chorus started or the verse started, and then a couple of days later started the chorus, probably after sound check of another church. And I just kind of piecemeal put songs together. It, it, it makes uh, it makes me more patient, and I think the finished product is better if I don't rush it. So I never really put a time limit on myself. Sometimes it takes weeks or months to get happy with it. Whether or not you remember for this song in particular, just as general rule of thumb, do you often start writing just words and then come up with the melody later? Or do you often have an idea for both that you're working on more or less simultaneously? Yeah. When I get the idea for a song, it usually lends itself to some musical musical meter. And, uh, and this one has such a a range in it that I don't know why, but I just felt that melody when mm -hmm. he calls me, I must go. So, which is a little unusual for our genre, but mm -hmm. I just, uh, I just felt that. And, and I just felt like I needed to, to start with a, uh, with a soft, mm -hmm. a soft few phrases, uh, Something with a picture, you know, Lazarus opened up his eyes, breathed a brand new breath. So <clears throat> the melody just kind of comes as the words do usually. And if I'm not happy with the melody, I'll keep working it out until, uh, until I can sing it and it's comfortable singing. Yes. Very interesting. So this song has a structure that, is kind of uncommon that we don't see often because it's pretty hard to pull off where verse one and verse two share a lot of the same language but verse one is sharing this language as lazarus's story and verse two then takes the same wording to describe jesus calling us from our graves at the resurrection do you know, or do you have any recollection, and if you don't recall specifically, that's perfectly fine, uh, but do you have any recollection of if, like from the start, you were thinking, you know, I might use some of the same wording, or maybe you get to verse two and you're like, you know, this works for us too. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't remember in this instance, but usually sure. when I get to verse 
Well, usually when I get the idea, I'm already thinking about how how am I going to end this? What do I want the listener? What's the journey going to be like? So, uh, and immediately I think, wow, we have so much in common with Lazarus. He's a human being with heart, lungs, eyes, just like us. He he died. We're going to die. So we can relate to him very personally because no matter what our personalities were like in this life, no matter what he was good at, his strengths, his weaknesses, whatever, no matter what my strengths or weaknesses are, yours, Daniel, when we're laying there dead and we hear the voice that calls us back to life, uh, whether that's, you know, we're in heaven and God reunites us with the body. We just know that there will be uh, bodies rising out of their graves. So we can certainly relate to Lazarus. So it was really pretty easy to draw the line together with verse 1 and 2 and put them in the same context. The only similarity is we'll both hear the same voice. And that's why I entitled the song, The Voice I Cannot Resist. And that's that's the similarity that matters. That's right. That's even if everything else is different, country, century, everything else, what matters is that we're listening to the same voice. Yes. <clears throat> so this song is universal in one sense, and that it applies to every Christian. But it's also it's not so broad that it can't be really personal. Um uh, the fears that we have as humans are really interesting because one person might be terrified of spiders or snakes, but another person loves them. Uh, one person is scared to death of public speaking. Another person loves it or, or heights or most of the, most any other common fear is something that some people fear and some other people really love. But death, I think is the one fear that's universal to the human condition uh, maybe not babies, but every human who's lived long enough to really understand what death is has had a fear of. And I know that fear is reduced for the Christian because Hebrews 2 says that uh, Jesus shared in our flesh and blood that he might, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this, this fear of death is less for the Christians because we know that Jesus has destroyed him who had the power of death mm-hmm. and it's it's less fear because where the unbeliever dies fearing what comes next we know that on the other side of death is jesus is heaven and to live as christ but to die as gain uh, but as much as we look forward to what comes after death the actual dying part is still at least a little scary for most of us it is for me and i think that's part of why this song speaks to me at such a deep place because, it, it, as you were saying a few minutes ago, it makes the connection so vividly between how the same voice that called Lazarus from the grave will be the voice that calls us back to life. Mm-hmm. So is, is speaking to this natural fear of death, perhaps, some of your thought process in, in writing verse 2? Or is it just something that happens to a line, perhaps? Well, I recognize that that the fear of death is the greatest fear for a human being. But I also recognize that a life with Christ uh, takes away that fear. And the reason for that is in the bridge, and I don't know if you want to talk about the bridge yet or let's not. Let's go for it. Uh, uh, let's see. I have the words. My heart has heard him speak a million times or more. So when he calls for me, I will know his voice. So it's not like. It'll be an unfamiliar feeling to die. I think it'll be a very familiar feeling, and I think it will be very uh, calming and natural and wonderful because this same voice that we've fellowshiped with all these years will be the one calling us home. And there's such comfort in that that, you know, I've heard people say, uh, you know, I want to I want to get to heaven and it feel natural to worship him. And I believe that's what it'll feel like if we spend our life serving him and praying and praising him 
I think we'll, when we enter his presence, it'll be all natural. It'll feel like we're right at home. Those four lines in the bridge are some of my favorite lines you've ever written. I just love, I love where you took it because a good bridge, I've heard a lot of songwriters say a good bridge doesn't just reiterate or repeat something that other verses said. It kind of brings in a new thought or a new angle. And and, and so you're coming into that final chorus from this new perspective. And I love how, you know, we've been talking up to the bridge about the power of Jesus's voice to call Lazarus and us from the grave. But the the bridge is talking about how we'll know it's Jesus's voice. And we know it's his voice because we listen to his voice. Now my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John says, um, so that is, that is just, I don't, I don't really have a question connected to that. I guess that's more just a comment. Mm -hmm. I love the pivot of how we know how we know it's Jesus's voice as we come back into this final chorus of, of the voice I could not resist. Amen. Amen. His it. voice will be familiar. And that's yes. There's there's peace in that, Daniel. Definitely. Uh, it's not we're not going into a strange place when we go to heaven. We are going to the place that will feel more like home than our own houses here. So that is something to look forward to. The feeling of being loved that much is something we all want. Yes, and and no matter how comfortable we can get as Christians in a particular context, we can love our families, our churches, our communities, and we do, Lord willing, hopefully, um, but... We're still pilgrims and strangers, as Hebrews 11 says, in search of a homeland, in search of that city who has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Yeah. Um, There is, at least among Christians who have read Scripture through and understand it, but maybe even among many who haven't, there is always that little bit of being a pilgrim and a stranger, no matter how wonderful a situation is. Yeah. So I have one question. Oh, I'm sorry. If you had something else to say, I was just going to say it's it's very true. Um, no matter how comfortable we get here, you know, it doesn't take long for something to come up in our lives, and we realize, you know what, this is just temporary. We want everything yes. to stay the same. We want everybody to stay healthy. We want everyone to live forever. We want our pets to live forever. Uh, we don't want any new ailments in our bodies, but. You know, we can kid ourselves and say, you know, I love how my life is, but just hang around a few few days, weeks, months, and we get thrown changes ah, that just remind us there's just no there's no consistency here and we'll have to get to heaven to have a true consistent existence and uh, we'll we'll enjoy that forever. Amen. I have a question about the arrangement, actually, of this song. On almost every Greater Vision song, I don't know if I can, my memory's confident enough to speak distinctly every, but on almost every other Greater Vision song, maybe not a Holy Night, there are trio harmonies at some point. Usually the choruses, I mean, sometimes the first verse also. Um, There are very few like this one that are just fully solo with no harmonies at any point. Do you have any recollection of why the decision was made that you were just going to sing this one yourself without harmonies? And did the massive range of the song have something to do with it? Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, on number two, yes. Uh, I think if I recall, this was the first project we did with Larry Goss producing it. So I don't have the CD handy, but just listening to it, I was like, I think this is Larry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the CD was called My Favorite Place. Yes. And uh, if I recall, that was his first time working with us hmm. since 1995 when he did an album with us. So hmm. this was almost 10 years later. And... Uh, we were so glad that he wanted to produce us again. And 
when he heard this song, it seems like he and Gerald said, you know what, because of the range of that chorus, and it's just kind of a personal song that talks about uh, me hearing God's voice, and it's just there's some lines that are so personal. I think they said, why don't you just sing this yourself? And uh, I was like, okay, I don't consider myself a great soloist, but I sang it, and uh, we didn't sing it every night or anything like that, but every now and then it seemed to bring a nice a nice uh, thought to a service. If we were in a church that, if Gerald thought it might work and might uh, might encourage someone, and we would we would do it then. Uh, and I I did it. it seemed like I did it for. Uh, one of Phil Cross's songwriter showcases in Louisville because I knew I didn't have to have the guys break their schedules to get there. I could just sing this one and talk about it. Uh, but I think it was Larry's idea to just to orchestrate it the way he did and and just uh, let it be a solo. I am almost completely positive I've heard you sing it live, but... I don't recall if it was there because I think I was there that that year. If okay. there, I also heard it at a Greater Vision concert. Okay. I definitely know the years I was at convention, being a bit of a writer myself, but like loving songwriting, the songwriting process, hearing songwriters share about songs. That was always a must see. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've heard you sing it live. Was there any question, if you recall, of would you sing it? Would I guess this was back when Jason was with the group, Jason or Gerald mm-hmm. sing it? Uh, or was it something that you knew you really wanted to sing it because it spoke to you in, in a deep way? Yeah, I think because it was, you know, when you first write a song, you're so excited about it. Mm-hmm. You think it's a hit song. And this one turned out to be not a hit song as the industry would call it a hit. But I just knew it was something that I felt like I could communicate. And not that the other guys couldn't have done it as well or better, but I just felt like, you know what, I think I could sing this. And uh, they were like, help yourself. And uh, they sang other songs on the CD. I, I, you're right. I mean, it wasn't a, a big radio hit or as the industry would have it, but sometimes there are these songs that weren't the hit but have such a message to them that, I mean, I feel like this one's timeless. Um, that Lord, if Jesus hasn't come back a hundred years from now, I I have a hard time imagining how this song wouldn't move people if somebody else sang it a hundred years from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if it wasn't, even if it didn't fit exactly what DJs wanted to hear in a top radio charting song in 2005, that's fine. There's certain things that are cool and just right for that moment. Mm-hmm. This one almost feels to me like it's one of those that exists outside of time. That, um, I mean, it's a little bit different than you'd have in an old hymnal, but that almost Fanny Crosby could have written it. But certainly somebody in like thirty or forty years before you could have written it. It it doesn't. It's timeless, I think. Well, thank you, Daniel. We never know what songs are going to last. And yeah. we have gotten requests for this on occasion. Uh, we haven't sung it several years now, but hmm. uh, we always on the second half of our programs uh, say, hey, come by the table, give us your request. And it back then especially, it wasn't unusual if someone asked for it. And we would do it to fulfill that request. But it's been a while since we've had a request for it. Well, I mean, it's been almost 20 years since it came yeah. out, so that's, you know, it's understandable. <laughs> uh, newer fans, there's always older fans have passed away or moved on, and newer fans come on. Newer fans weren't there when it came out, and it's more, yeah. they might go back and hear it, but, you know, it's a little different, maybe. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you might have in mind about the song as an interesting story connected to it, either writing it or how it's been received that might be something I didn't think to ask about. Uh, I think the uh, the idea of could not resist. Mm-hmm. You know, as long as our hearts are beating, 
we can resist God. We can we can say, no, I'm not going to do that. I know you've told me to do that, but I'm not going to do that. Just like a child will resist a parent. And uh, Jonah resisted God. You know, mm-hmm. we, we pay the price when we resist, but we can resist. But when we're in that state of uh, total surrender and death, we have no choice but to obey his voice. And that's that's kind of another uh, element I wanted to bring in the song was that uh, I would never want to resist him calling me uh, to my eternal home. But even if I could, or even if I wanted to, I couldn't, because when he calls me, I must go. The, I wrote in the chorus because... It's it's a joyful surrender, and it's a joyful uh, being caught up with him, uh, caught up with him in the air. And however it happens, it will definitely be a moment that we can't say, no, 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 leave me down here. Uh, we will be under his authority uh, as his child, and uh, it's all up to him at that point. And only what we've done with Christ while we did have breath in our lungs will matter. There is an element of this song that I don't think I completely understood until I was hearing you talk about it. Which is, I hear verse 2 and the bridge. And I'm thinking, like, my brain, and I think it, my brain's going to the resurrection. Uh, I, my, my brain started going so fast, I started going into about three sentences at once, and I'm like, no, I need to land one sentence before I move on to the next one. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it's uh, like like where you say, deep within the ground, but that's not where I'll stay, for I will hear a voice. Um, mm-hmm. So like at that point, my brain's thinking, resurrection. But it's interesting, because as you talk about it, I think you're kind of almost seeing two layers to the second verse in Bridge, because at some level... It's God calling us home to heaven at our death. Right. Uh, but then there's also some wording in here that points to that second call where he'll call our bodies from the ground to be resurrected as well. Yes. And so you're kind of speaking to both then. Yes, I tried to tried to cover it all. And, uh, you know, we don't know how that works. Absent with the body, present with the Lord. Mm-hmm. So I believe we'll, we go straight to heaven. And exactly. I don't know how he then <clears throat> combines that body that is uh, joined together with the soul for eternity, uh, whether we come back down here and jump in the grave and then he pulls us out, you know, I don't know how that'll be, but all I know is there will be a, um, a catching up in the air and meeting him mm-hmm. in the clouds, and uh, and that will be when that voice calls us. Just like he said, Lazarus, come forth. You know, when he says, child, come forth, uh, we will have no option. We will be caught up by his supernatural power into his presence for eternity. And it will be a voice that we cannot resist. Amen. Well said. So as I move toward wrapping up, um, as I mentioned at the start, this audience will be a mixture of people like me who've loved your songs for years and uh, people who are you know new to your music uh, and so really this question is for both sets of people what are some of your favorite songs that you've written uh whether or not they're the big songs or a song that might not you know might be like this one that isn't mm-hmm. as as well as widely known uh and especially kind of the same question maybe a little bit of a different question if someone's new to your songs where might they start so this is just to give somebody who's listening, who this is their first song of yours they've heard, give them a few other songs to listen to. Oh, uh, well, my favorite, I guess, has to be Faces. That's a song okay. that I wrote about encouraging the everyday Christian to just be the Bill West like he was to my father. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be talented, gifted, just... Uh, Love on people, invite them to church, let them see Christ in you, and, and let the Lord do the rest. Uh, and when you get to heaven, you'll see their faces. So it's encouraged a lot of people, been used in a lot of uh, pastor appreciation days, missionary retirement services, uh, just really 
we still sing this song regularly. And that one was written about a year after The Voice I Cannot Resist. So it's almost 20 years old as well. Uh, one that's a little older is The Spirit of Brokenness. I was wondering if you were going to mention that one because I remember <laughs> hearing you mention that as one of your favorites in the past. Yeah, I don't know why because it's not one that we sang a lot. It was not a radio type song. But it just, uh, Lord, give me the spirit of brokenness like you gave when I first called your name. Uh, we tend to grow a little calloused as we get older instead of softer sometimes. And, and the song just says, Lord, give me uh, the same zeal I had when I got saved to serve you. Um, some... Those are the more serious ones. Some of the more fun songs. He'd Have Still Been God is one we recorded in 1997 that we still still sing every night. My Name is Lazarus we recorded in 1998. Um, God Wants to Hear You Sing. That uh, song. I love that song. I, lo I love all the songs you mentioned, but God Wants to Hear You Sing is just it's so majestic. Wow, thank you. That's... That one was recorded in 2000, I think. Uh, I don't know, more more recently, a couple of years ago, uh, Still uh, was a song mm -hmm. that, that I really enjoyed, Encouraging the Church of Today. Uh, I Choose, recorded by Ivan Parker, mm -hmm. uh, back several years ago is one of my favorites. Uh, people can just go maybe search on Pandora or or Apple Music for Greater Vision, and you can just kind of do a search there, and <clears throat> you might can Google songs I've written. I don't know. I've never looked there. Um, and just for for the listener, uh, Rodney probably writes three quarters of Greater Vision songs. Uh, on average through the years. Definitely there have been a few other writers who have written some of their songs, so not every song you hear in a Greater Vision recording is one he's written. That's right. In particular, since Chris Allman came back with the group, mm -hmm. he's written a number of uh, really good, good, strong songs, and I think most albums have a couple songs he's done too. Yes. Uh, but if you listen to Greater Vision's entire discography through the years, um, outside of the Hymns albums, which are marked and labeled as such, um, yeah, he's written a good chunk, good chunk of your song, good chunk of the songs. Um, I'll mention a few other songs I really like. Uh, a pile of crowns. Oh yeah, we still uh, get requests for that. That's that's just hmm. a special song. Um, a couple songs you wrote for the Kingdom Heirs as many times in the depth of the Father's love. Yeah, are right. just some real cool songs. And then uh, just a personal favorite for obvious reasons, I guess. In the sandals of Daniel, I think speaks something to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it speaks something to our current cultural context. Yeah, that's true. That's it's true. Very, it's very timely. That's true. Uh, you're speaking of writers in our group. We also, now we have John Epley, who's been oh. here a little over six years, I guess. And he has written a couple of our latest sing or our, our number one song a couple of years ago. Uh, hmm. um, <laughs> you Are My King. I apologize. Sure. And I think uh, the next single after the first of the year, Your Healing is on the Way, will be one of John's songs. Tremendous hmm. writer. So I'm very blessed to be surrounded by gifted people who can write anything. And I just enjoy hearing what they come up with. Wonderful. Well, just to conclude, uh, how can people best keep up with you and with uh, Greater Vision? And you can just mention some places. I'll put the links in the show notes so people can just click click through to the yeah. website and social media and all. Yeah, greatervisionmusic.com. Uh, be sure to download the Bands in Town app, and that is the best way to be notified when we're coming to your area. Uh, follow Greater Vision on that. You know, Greater Vision's on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Uh, Used to be Twitter, whatever it is now, uh, uh, Instagram. We do all that uh, to give people things to read and uh, everything personal from our our families to where we're traveling to, 
to uh, what's going on in their lives. So you can follow us all there. Yes. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and talk about this song. I, as I said at the intro, from day one when the album first came out, I was like, this is a special song, and I've liked it this whole time. Uh, it's been a delight after this many years of liking this song to actually chat in depth with you about it. This was really cool. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, Daniel, and thanks for thanks for loving a song that I haven't heard much about all these years, honestly. It's not one that people come up and say, oh, this song touched my heart. So thank you for being open to that, and sure. it's encouraging to me to know that there are songs that – uh, maybe I feel like didn't get much attention through the years, but landed with someone as encouraging to this day. This one definitely has for me. And I hope that as people listen to this, whether they're a first time or a long time, greater vision listener, I hope that, um, just reflecting on this song and listening to extended reflection on it, like this is, will help them come at it with a new set of eyes. And maybe it'll move up their lists a little bit too. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, and to the listeners, just to conclude, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend and subscribe on whatever platform you prefer to catch future episodes. You can also find past episodes in the free 54,000 entry expository songs searchable database at danielmount.com. Thank you for listening.